£3.8 million. This is BBC One, now Crime Watch UK with Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce. viewers called us last month tonight it could be you and these are some of the faces we're looking for and we'll be telling you what they've been up to later have a pen and paper ready our number is on the screen The Notting Hill Carnival is the second biggest street party in the world, with one and a half million people taking part. On the main day, that's the August Bank Holiday Monday, Greg Watson travelled in from the London suburbs with his girlfriend, Lisa Morgan. Everyone loved Greg, everyone. You can help but love him, he's just, you know, he's a great guy. Greg and Lisa arrived early afternoon, met up with a group of four friends and joined in the fun. Watching the procession, dancing to the music, absorbed by the huge crowd drawn from around the world. Eventually, Greg and Lisa and their friends started to think about heading back for home, but no one was in any sort of hurry. We were just going to follow a float. Um, and then just make our way home from there. Yeah, just nothing definite. We just seen what happened, really. Um, but you know, we knew we couldn't stay too late because you know we still had to get the train back. And by now it was dark. This is Kensal Road near the Radio One sound stage at around ten o'clock, and these are some of the last floats in the procession. Among the crowd was a gang of at least five youths who'd been pestering girls who were passing by and they grabbed at a 15-year-old in Greg and Lisa's group. Things just went mad. Then a guy just came up and being, like, you know, really rude and mouthy and shouting all kind of obscenities at us. It started to get a bit mouthy, so Greg came over, just tried to um, calm the situation down. What follows is one of the very few times a murder has been filmed by the police. The surveillance officer was Andrew Coles. Yeah, I was up on the uh, balcony here just watching some of the last of the floats going through and uh, saw some people having an argument roughly down at the junction with East Row. Couldn't really tell what the argument was about, but it was obviously quite heated. You'll see Greg walking back trying to defuse the situation. He just wanted to, this, it to stop. You know, he just... We were going home. We just wanted to go home. And gradually the uh, argument continued, moved over onto the footway, just under the light between the two trees. I, I, mean, I don't actually know what was going through my head at that precise... I just, it was just all just mad, I just couldn't believe it. And then I saw one of the, uh, one of the lads break off, walk round behind the girls and face the lad who'd been trying to pull the girls away. And uh, then uh, he appeared to just punch him to the stomach. Yeah, another guy just came from nowhere and just stabbed him. And then the five boys ran off up the road. Well, he just, like, staggered back. There were some cars there. And he just said, someone, get me an ambulance. And then he fell. Well, this is roughly where... Greg, we found Greg Watson lying. Um, we had to push our way through the group of people that were around him, and we were joined within a minute by two police medics who basically took over from us. The wound didn't look that serious because there was no blood coming out of it, but as we later found out, Greg uh, died in hospital. There was nothing bad about him.
it's just perfect. And just that smile, just that smile. You could just, you, you just see him coming around the corner. You could see the smile before you see him. You know, that type of happy-go-lucky person. Well, I am really torn apart because he wasn't only my son, he's my closest friend. Just, you know, he's just a brilliant guy, brilliant. Now, that's not something I've ever seen before, and I have to say, I hope I never, ever see it again. Now, Guy Ferguson, you're the officer in charge of this case. This seems to have been a totally unprovoked attack. Now, what about the gang? Do we know where they went next? What happened to them? Yes, we believe that they went off, um, and I think you can see on the map, from outside the Radio 1 soundstage at Horniman's Pleasance towards Lad Ladbroke Grove. Um, we're not exactly sure where, where they went, but they could have gone north, north or south from there. What about the attacker? What can you tell us about him? Well, he involved himself in an incident which he had, you know, initially nothing to do with and uh, merely went in and did the attack uh, without any preamble at all. Um, he's in his late teens to early 20s. He's 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 tall. The most distinctive thing about him was that he had short black hair that was shaved at the side but longer on, on the top, perhaps in twists and he was wearing a black hooded top with dark trousers. And what about the man who started the argument with Greg? What do you know about him? Well, he was um, wearing a green shirt which was open over a black vest. He is considerably lighter skinned than the attacker, but um, he um, is the same sort of age, same height, but uh, of slimmer build. Now, some people might question the decision to show something like this, a murder on television, and I, I should add, actually, there are scenes, much more upsetting scenes after the event of Greg that we have decided not to show. But what made you come forward with this footage? It's a decision we laboured long and hard over, really, and in consultation with Greg's parents. But we decided that it was appropriate to show it because it was such an unprovoked and horrendous attack um, in an effort to appeal to people who might have vital information in, to, in regard to this, who have been reluctant to come forward. And also, we felt that um, I'm quite confident that there's somebody out there who knows the identity of Greg's killer and, and the green shirt man, and I want those people to come, for, come forward and tell us uh, that information now for the sake of Greg's family. OK, well, there's a £10,000 reward. Um, call here in the studio on our free phone number. That's 0500 600 600. That's on the screen for most of the show. Or call the incident room on 020 7321 7228. I'm delighted to say there's been a lot of progress since last month. Stephen Reed, who was found by Crime Watch viewers in Brighton, has been sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Elizabeth Stacey at Westminster University. Again, as a result of viewers' calls, several people are in custody following the violent robbery in which a gang broke into a warehouse in Huddersfield and beat up one of the staff. And one of the highest profile investigations ever, the disappearance of the estate agent Susie Lamplew in 1986. Detectives say two remarkable new leads have come in as a result of our appeal in July. Meet Bungalow Bill. We're calling him that because he's been stealing from bungalows and not paying his bills. Luckily for us, he made a cameo appearance in a home video. I had stuff under the water. I had a wallet of 900 quid. <laughs> his Christmas holiday in Cornwall last year with his wife and four children was one big crime wave. When staying at the Crooked Inn in Saltash, he stole everything he could lay his hands on and even tried to make off with the owner's car. Who is he and where is he now? Call the stu studio or the incident room on 01579 325 490. And here's another thief caught on camera and he might want a copy of this for his album. Six weeks ago in Kensington, London, a woman was robbed by a man on a bike, but the handbag got tangled in the chain and gear mechanism, which neatly forwarded his getaway. A quick-thinking photographer was passing by, and snap! So who is this thin young man posing rather reluctantly? 0500 600 600 or 020 8246 0173. Just over a year ago, 17-year-old Vicky Hall was murdered in Suffolk. Detectives had several leads, but all have proved fruitless, and that pretty much takes them back to square one. So, 13 months on, 
it's up to you. What's your favourite pop group? At the moment, at this moment in time, it's the Spice Girls. Ooh, best actor. Ah, uh, what's Leonardo DiCaprio? DiCaprio? <laughs> what about drinks here, Vicky? <laughs> She was our firstborn. She was just Victoria, yeah. She was our little girl. And she was a little girl. She wasn't a tomboy. She was a proper little girl. Dresses, makeup, music. <laughs> She was making her own decisions. She was talking about going to university, going on holiday with her friends. It's growing up. You have to let them grow up. You can't keep them at home with you all the time. That nice one wasn't there tonight. Yeah. Do you see what his mate was wearing? Yeah, gross. Oh, I fancy some chips. Yeah. I've only got taxi money left. Me too. Chips means walking. Yeah. Chips. Chips. A happy, friendly little girl. She did enjoy her dancing. She was quite intelligent. She used to, she was doing well at the school works and, and things and she was really enjoying the sixth form. Tomorrow. Yeah. You hear me saying out of the way home. Put your shoes back on. See ya. Bye. She got onto the estate where she'd lived since she was born and she thought she was safe there. I was just walking past the fish and chip shop in Trimley and I thought I heard a scream. But obviously I didn't think at the time. I think that I should have registered. Maybe thought about what other Vicky was walking down there. But because she, you never think that it's going to happen, so that's probably why I didn't. Vicky disappeared, and her family agonised about where she was and what had happened to her. 25 miles away at Creeting St Peter, there's one potential clue. The morning after Vicky vanished, a customised blue Vauxhall Astra van was seen in Pound Lane. It needs to be checked out of the inquiry because a week later, Vicky's body was discovered dumped in a ditch beside the road. The feelings are just the same a year ago as they are today. It's just that some, most of the time we cope with them a lot better. But we all miss her so very, very much. When your child gets married, you know they're going to move away, but they're always in contact. You can phone them up, you can write a letter, you can speak to them. But we haven't got that anymore. Victoria's gone and we can't ever speak to her again. And that feeling never, ever goes away. It's there all the time. So tragic. So little to go on. It's had so much publicity, this. It was such a big event in East Anglia. Presumably everybody who had solid suspicions has long ago come to you. 
That's right, it's a terrible crime which affected the whole community. But I believe there's still somebody out there that may be wondering, although not wanting to believe it, that some member of their family, their, their, their husband, their son or a relative, uh, may their behaviour may have changed about this period on the 19th of September a year ago. So what you're asking for is anybody in, in what sort of area, the whole of East Anglia and the whole of Southern Anybody who, who may know that their relative has got connections with Creeting St Peter or Trimley St Mary in Suffolk, who may have noticed behaviour changing, perhaps somebody that morning came home, they were dishevelled. That would have been a Sunday morning. Sunday morning in the early hours between, say, half past two and six a.m., something like that, where they would have come home and the next morning, quite unnaturally, wanted to wash their clothing or wanted to clean the car. Maybe they sold the car. Or perhaps took an un unusual interest in the publicity thereafter. I mean, just anything that arouses suspicion. Anything that arouses suspicion and that there may be connections with that area. I know people would not want to believe that of someone that they knew, but we really need help to find out what happened to Vicky. Now, this customised blue Astra van, can't be many of those around, but you still have been unable to trace the one that was seen. Yes, we've eliminated a, a number from the East Anglian area, but it's still important. This vehicle may be involved or it might not be. He may be a witness. He may have seen something which is suspicious. I would appeal for whoever that driver is or somebody who knows uh, that vehicle to come forward and ring us at the incident room. OK, well, if you have uh, any suspicions, even very slight suspicions, let the police check it out. It's easy for them to do so. Call here in the studio. Or you can call the incident room, that's on 01473 613540. And if you want to give information anonymously on this, or any other crime, you can call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Now just look at this. A train deliberately set on fire by two young boys near Denmark Hill, South London. Want to know who did it? Well, here they are. They got onto the train and picked up a newspaper each. Next, the shorter one kept watch while the other set the blaze. It could have been absolutely disastrous. If one of these is your son, please bring him into a police station before other viewers tell us who he is. 020 7391 5275. Two more sad young lads now and a very nasty robbery in Stoneley in Surrey. They hang around in an off-licence, worrying the assistant, and then one makes a dive for the till while the other runs up to batter the shopkeeper on the head. And he then tries to hit him again. So who are they? 01372 845 575. An apologetic gunman this time. Sorry about this. Sorry. Sorry to do this, he said, as he pushed staff into a stockroom in Epsom. Now, if he's really sorry, he can call us tonight and give the money back. If not, please call on his behalf. He was wearing a beanie hat and an old scarlet leather bomber jacket with a red Indian motif on the back. Sorry, he may be, but we do need to find him. Please call us in here in the studio on 0500 600 600 or 01737 236 245. <laughs> Viewers' calls led to two young men from South East London being charged for a terrible attack at a railway station on a man with learning difficulties. Jonathan Lemoon, suspected of stabbing Robert Murphy to death in Dover, has handed himself into a police station. He was persuaded by a relative who'd seen the CCTV on Crime Watch. Another stabbing, this time outside a nightclub in Bradford. Simon Noble was arrested just after getting married. A man's been arrested after a tip-off by Crime Watch viewers after he tried to cash stolen cheques in Switzerland. Some fantastic results there, and I'd just like to add one more. Back in January, we featured the case of Mary Gregson, who'd been raped and murdered in Shipley 23 years ago. I'll always remember it because it was my first case on Crime Watch, and it was the oldest case the programme had ever tackled. To be honest, I thought the chances of success were pretty slim. Mary was my sister, my best friend. She took me to school for the first time. We were very close. It seems a long time since I saw her. Um, but a lot of things are very vivid. It's just like yesterday. Tara, then, see you at half seven ish. Be good. I will. Bye. 
she was working with me at Salt's Mill. That was a meeting point on the canal side. And if I was there first, I'd wait, you know, watch, see if I could see her coming. Soon afterwards, another woman was also heading for work and had a disturbing encounter. What's happened to that girl? What do you do with her? Nothing. She, she fell off the wall. You want help? I get ambulance. Police. I, I don't need nothing. Susan. Sorry to bother you, Bill, but I was wondering if Mary was okay. Okay? But what do you mean? What's happened? She's with you, isn't she? She never showed up for work, Bill. I just assumed she were feeling poorly. I waited for her at bridge, but there were no signs. The following morning, my husband had gone back out to resume searching, and he came back with a police officer. He'd witnessed my sister being brought out of the river. That Mary Gregson's murder was solved was thanks to the absolute refusal of the police to let this case go. 23 years ago, they found a microscopic amount of DNA from the killer on Mary's clothing. They had no way of producing a profile from it. But with each new development in DNA technology, the police went back to that tiny sample to try to unlock its secret. Four attempts later, it yielded enough information for them to start testing suspects. That's when they called us. Independently of our appeal, Ian Lau the voluntarily gave a mouth swab and the police had their man. He's now serving a life sentence. Mary's sister told Crime Watch, I never gave up hope. I always knew the police would find who was responsible. She was right. Just trying to catch up on some of the calls we've got. I can tell you we've got an address for one suspect. Uh, most of the calls we've had so far, at least that I've been able to digest, are on the Notting, Hall, uh, Notting Hill stabbing. Now, we've got six names that have been put forward. One name has come in twice. One's come in from a police officer. Uh, and we're getting a lot of uh, other interesting things coming in. For example, we've got at least one other witness to the stabbing and somebody else who at least saw uh, something that was going on there. Um, and we've got a very interesting one here on the Vicky Hall murder a year ago uh, about that blue vehicle. Again, I've got to check this out with the police officers and probably check this out in Suffolk, but it does look on the face of it very, very interesting indeed. Keep watching. Uh, we'll let you know more as the evening goes on. And uh, see if you know this man. He assaulted a schoolgirl near Worcester she was very lucky to escape. She ran as fast as she could in absolute terror and desperation to get away from that man. She knew she had to get away from him and she ran as fast as she could to safety. Show you more of that later. Meanwhile, this is Yap Bornkamp. He was murdered almost casually by a passerby and possibly by these men, both stocky, both in their thirties. Yap was simply walking with his friend in New Cross Road, South London, on a Sunday morning back in June, and as they passed two men in the street, one sunk a knife into his chest. Now, Yap was gay, and this is his partner, Daniel Spiteri. I lived with Yap for 17 years, so I, I miss him just being around the house, and we had a huge trust uh, in each other, and I think that's something that's quite difficult to achieve in life, so I've lost that now. The sister of a man stabbed to death last month in a South London street has flown in from the Netherlands to make an urgent appeal for help to find his killers. Detectives say Jaap Bornkamp, who ran a successful florist business from his own home, was killed simply because he was gay. My mother is 86 years old and my family, he missed Jaap very much. He was a brilliant florist and a good person to everybody. I think he was one of life's enhancers, really. He just brought um, joy and brilliance to so many people's lives. And, you know, that, that sort of character, that sort of unusual one-off character is just impossible to replace. Uh, he was just an amazing person. So take a look at these two men again. Maybe you saw them that Sunday morning back in June. Or were you the driver of the white van that stopped to let them cross the street? or this man in the white trench coat in New Cross Road. And finally, this is similar to the murder weapon. It's uh, an all-metal commando-style knife with a spider's web, I don't know if you can see that, on the handle here. 
I can tell you the whole thing, it's made of metal, but the whole thing is very dangerous. This blade is very, very sharp. Do you know who owned this? You could help find Yap's killer. Please call us 0500 600 600 or 020 8217 6461. And another knifing resulting in dreadful injuries. Now we're looking for this man in connection with an attack seven months ago outside a pub in Bilston in Wolverhampton. One man had his throat cut and the other had his nose almost completely severed. Now the knife man was wearing a distinctive yellow polo shirt. If you know who he is, let's get him charged. 01902 649 163. And if you live anywhere in Wales, watch out for these two. Here they are in a grocery store in the Brecon Beacons, but they're wanted by all four Welsh police forces for what are called distraction burglaries. Typically, typically one man starts a conversation in a hotel or a bar while the other nips behind into the office to steal cash or keys. Please ring 01267 226 327. We have a crime now reconstructed not by us at Crime Watch, but by the police themselves. And I can tell you it's about events so violent, so unwarranted, that the actors couldn't believe what they were being asked to portray. They kept saying, surely the robbers didn't really do this. But they did. Six weeks ago, during the late August bank holiday, Joe and Josephine Martirana went shopping in London's Knightsbridge, and then eventually they drove home to the house in Hoddesdon in Hertfordshire. Wonder what they want. Peter! Run! Run! Got a gun! Run! Get out! Run! Run! All this apparently to steal two wristwatches. The gunman fled to a silver Vauxhall Vectra but the road is a cul-de-sac, and Joe tried to block their retreat. Having misjudged that, he then gave chase. You may have seen the high-speed pursuit that followed up Hoddesdon High Street towards the dual carriageway. Remember, it's August Bank Holiday Monday. Did you see the shunt at Lampitt's Roundabout? And at the Essex Road roundabout, the Vectra swerved and sped off in the opposite direction, almost colliding with the truck. I think it's 16 years on crime, which I've never seen anything quite so mad and appalling. Three people were actually hit. Mrs. Maturano died. That's absolutely right. Um, certainly, I've never seen anything like this before. It was a particularly brutal and violent attack. Um, actually, Josephine was running away from the gunman when she was shot. Um, her son, Stephen, who was inside on hearing the commotion, ran out of the front door and was immediately shot in the chest, followed by his girlfriend, Bella, who was also inside, and she was shot. It is so appalling, this, that I suspect that even in the underworld, people are going to be prepared to shot these guys. I mean, you know, what they say, there's a blagging, but this goes well beyond, beyond that. So, what are the clues? What are the guys like? We know about the car. We've got a silver Vauxhall, obviously may have been damaged in, in the back. What else do you know? That's absolutely right. What we do know is that the, the two offenders in this case were both black males, about six foot tall, slim, wearing duck clothing, and obviously we're trying to, to trace these men. Um, we're also looking for the Rolex watches that were stolen at the time, and in order to assist us, of course, we've got a, a huge reward um, on offer of £25,000. £25,000? That's right. Um, I think it reflects the, the serious nature of this offence and also, of course, we are asking somebody to inform on people that they know have committed this crime and I think it needs to be a substantial amount to attract them. Can I ask you about the gun that was shown? It was a, a, a silver gun. Do you know it was a big silver gun or, or was that just, just used for the reconstruction? It could have been any, any gun, anyway. No, we know it was a silver gun, um, but we're not sure of the size of it. It was definitely a silver gun, then. OK, so the best that you're hoping for tonight is that someone can put together a slim, tall, two black males, the silver Vauxhall Vectra, damaged in the back. This is, of course, August Bank Holiday. They might have got rid of it by then. The Rolex watches, put all that together with a reward. And indeed, the Sainsbury's driver, there, during the course of a chase from um, Joseph's house, um, the Vectra, we know, almost collided with the Sainsbury's lorry. 
um, at a place called um, Essex Road Roundabout. Um, despite our efforts and those of Sainsbury's, we haven't been able to trace that driver and we would very much like him to come forward. So if anybody knows a Sainsbury's driver, was he in Hardison in Hertfordshire or anywhere around there on August Bank Holiday? It's, um, I mean, frankly, it's hard to find words to describe the people who did this to the Mantaranas. Make sure they don't do it to your family or to anybody else's. Any clue at all, just ring us now, 0500 600 600 or 01 707 Dear Sir Rob Jones has just come to us with this next case as Avon and Somerset Police are desperate to find Lee Tucker. He is a convicted paedophile who did a runner halfway through his trial. His victims, two teenage boys, were subjected, subjected to very serious sexual abuse. It is so important to get Lee Tucker behind bars. It's also useful for you to, to, for you to know that he's developed AIDS and he could be passing it on. 0117 945 4001. Three more faces for you to find now. First, this is Christopher Jackson from Merseyside, who had a row with his ex-boss. The boss was found shot, and we'd like to ask Mr Jackson about it. Next, this is another, but unrelated Jackson, Stephen Sharman Jackson, also known as Shiver, from Lincolnshire. He skipped bail on a major drugs charge. And finally, this is Wayne Riley, wanted in Manchester after a stash of Class A drugs was found in Bolton. If you know where any of these three are, call us here in the studio on 0500 600 600. Who do you know who's in his 30s, scruffy, and could have been in Worcester midsummer, specifically in June? If you live or work in the area, see if you recognise this man. All five questions. Are you writing out the questions as well? Yes. Has anyone got any other questions about the homework? What happens if you don't do? Or what normally happens if you don't do your homework? Detention. OK, so make sure that everyone does their homework. <laughs> Just a normal 14-year-old girl. You know how they wake up in the morning and say, mmm, school. <laughs> but when they get there, they enjoy it. Enjoy your walk. Hold me long, get your nice drink. I had to break suddenly, so I wouldn't knock him over. He then walked round to the passenger side of the car and said, Can you give us a lift? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. He had like bushy eyebrows and piercing eyes. He was unshaved, so whether he had been living rough, I don't know. Oh gosh, so. Who was that? Little less noise at the back, thank you. I came over the little bridge that leads to Woodborough Lane and uh, I noticed this figure in the middle of the road who cast a furtive look in my direction and then scurried across the road as though he didn't want to be seen. He was wearing what looked to be like a, an old army greatcoat. He looked rather scruffy. I tried to see what he was doing and what he was playing at because he looked so funny. <laughs> She was grabbed from behind by a man holding a knife. And he said, I'm not going to hurt you. But he didn't let go of the knife. And he pushed her into a, a thicket, a wooded area, under a fence. And he had his coat laid out already, and he, he assaulted her. And then he told her to kneel down in front of him on, the, on this coat. At which point, she ran as fast as she could in absolute terror and desperation to get away from that man. She knew she had to get away from him and she ran as fast as she could to safety. Five minutes later, a witness saw a man she thought was a jogger running towards the retreat pub in Woodbury Lane towards Norton Barracks. He was wearing a bright red top and may have been carrying a coat. Did you see him too? More sightings came in. At a roadblock on the A44, police discovered the man may have been seen the day before the attack. And this guy just suddenly stepped right out in front of the car. I mean, I don't know how I didn't kill him. 
wanted her to brake really quickly. And he, he sort of lurched over towards the passenger side by the windscreen. I thought he was going to try and jump on the car. And she was sitting right there and was really scared. And um, he was just ignoring me and, and staring at her, wasn't he? I don't, I don't know who he was, but there was something about it. He, he looked familiar, and I can't work out what it was. That's it. About, about two weeks ago, um, I was on a footpath, and you never, you never see anyone there. And there was something about him that made me feel really uneasy. And to feel more confident, I just said, oh, afternoon, when I walked past him. And with that, he, he just disappeared off. You can't help thinking, what if? What if she hadn't got away? What if he'd used the knife? Let's have a look. But you can't dwell on those things. She Very had the good. presence of mind to run. OK. Make sure you made a clear note. She was really brave. There's Any no doubt questions? about it. Well, thank goodness she got away. Now, tell us a bit more about the attacker. It, it seems as if he, he knows the area. Yes, it was very much a pre-planned attack um, by a, a man who, who's got knowledge of that area um, through knowing it or from living there, but definitely got knowledge of that area because of the way he's, he's pre-planned this attack. Now, he may have been in the area then, but not necessarily before, and he could be anywhere now, of course. That's correct. We've got sightings uh, of a man fitting his description in the previous fortnight leading up to it. Uh, it could have been that he's stopping with relatives, with friends, or he could have even been living rough. What did he look like? He's quite distinctive, uh, given that it's June, it's, it's in the summer. He, he's a white man, he's uh, 30 to 40 years of age, about 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 10 inches tall, medium build, uh, and distinctively, the, the girl is remembered, he's got quite f faint eyebrows, which would indicate he might have fair or blonde hair. Um, he was wearing um, dark tracksuit bottoms, uh, a red top, probably a, a T-shirt or a polo shirt of that description but quite uh, distinctively a, a blue and white uh, woolly hat, which obviously covered up his hair. Um, and also it was a very odd thing to wear because it was the summer. Absolutely, that's right. Uh, and one witness has, has described him wearing a, a three-quarter length coat, which he describes as a, a grey coat, but a three-quarter uh, three length coat, brown or khaki in colour. So pretty distinctive. Do you think he'll offend again? This was a pre-planned attack, and we believe, yes, he will. So we need to catch him. Now, there's a car you want to eliminate from the isn't there? Yeah, a short distance away in a, a, a lane called Mucknall Lane, which is only five, six hundred yards away from the scene, a, a farmer's lane, in fact. There was a scene, a, um, a silver, medium-sized saloon car, a little bit tatty, um, make we don't know, uh, which was seen at the relevant time by the farmer. Um, it, it may be uh, connected, it may not be, but we need to eliminate that vehicle. OK, well, let's see what we can do tonight. As you heard, the police there think this man will offend again. We need to catch him. Give us a ring in the studio or call 01905 723 888. And if you've been moved by this case because you've suffered some sort of assault yourself, whether you're a girl or a boy, and you want to speak about it confidentially, there are volunteers from now until 2 in the morning at Victim Support Line on 0845 30 30 900. 22-year-old Lee Ronan had lots to look forward to. He'd just been promoted, and here he is as best man at a friend's wedding. Nine months ago, in a country lane near Tondi in Abergenvig in South Wales, he was struck by a car and killed outright. The driver was taking an illegal cut-through and then just sped off. Now, forensics have revealed it was a Mark III red Vauxhall Cavalier with a registration plate that's believed to be a K, L, M or N. Now, this obviously is a long shot, but Lee's family are desperate to resolve this. Please help. 0500 600 600 or 01656 679 544. As a result of viewers' calls, two men have been arrested over the theft of high-performance cars. Again, as a direct result of calls to Crime Watch, four more people have been sentenced for taking part in the so-called anti-capitalist riots. But American-born James Stephen Borick has skipped bail. He's been charged with a serious assault. And while we were on the air last month, viewers named a man whose arrest has helped crack a major London fraud. 
Well, as ever, a lot of people calling in tonight. We've had a lot of van sightings. That's the blue van in the Vicky Hall case, encouraging quite a few in the same place. But we are getting so many calls on the blue van. Um, what we're after specifically is a very unusually customised blue Astrovan in the East Anglia area. So blue Astrovans anywhere else, we're not that interested in. In the Notting Hill murder, we've had six names for the suspects, and one name has been mentioned four times. Don't forget, you can ring us or you can email us at crimewatchuk at BBC co.uk keep getting in touch and a quick update on two cases though not as a direct result of crime watch daniel collins has been charged with the murder of beje alevitsa we appealed about her death a year ago and on one of our appeals from last month staffordshire police have charged michael Ivor chigi with the murder of 17 year old heather tell this is a nice looking chap and lots of women unfortunately seem to fall for him. He's Colin Anderson, a youthful looking 53 and he's vanished and so has a lot of other people's cash. He's described as a bit of a charmer and you can judge that for yourself because here he is on a Kilroy programme 12 years ago, looking somewhat younger. I was 15 and over a 20 year period, it took me 20 years to stop drinking. I, I, I drank progressively more as the years went on. Um, I lost my family, friends, money, home. Why were you drinking? Why was I drinking? Uh, you, 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 you drink, you, you start drinking as a kid, you know, you just have a drink and then you go on and it's something you just cannot stop. Where is he now? 0500 600 600 or 01 444 445 817. Who's this flustered-looking man? Papworth Hospital in Cambridge is famous for heart operations, but someone who's been in there plainly doesn't have much of a heart. He stole a wallet from a member of staff at the hospital, and within four hours, this, had a, this man had made 16 withdrawals from eight different banks. Ring 01480 415 531. Nine months ago, Daniel Davis, a young father, was stabbed and later died in hospital. And we want to find Alex Barry Henderson. Now, he may be working as a DJ in London using the name MC Kid. He also calls himself Jamal Timberland James. He has a tattoo on his left arm which says primetime player and a boxing glove hanging on a, pe uh, a bracelet. Alex Henderson, where are you? 01245 464 and let me just remind you, if you want to speak confidentially to Victim Support Line, the number is 0845 30 30 900. There are more numbers on CFAX on page 61, more calls coming in, more names, more chance of some real news in an hour and a half. Crime Watch update is 11.45. Join us then. If you're not going to wait up till then, well, uh, we'll fill you in on next month's show with all that's coming in at the moment, and uh, no doubt more will come in over the weeks ahead. Incidentally, next month's show is going to be at the earlier time of 9 p.m. We're 9 o'clock from now on. Have a great month. Don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.